Back when I first got my start in business, I had a black planner. It was a Franklin Covey planner. And I bought myself a copy of Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Leaders, or Highly Effective People, rather. And if you remember those habits, they were be proactive, begin with the end in mind, put first things first, think win-win, seek first to understand and then to be understood, synergize, and sharpen the saw. These are what I'm now realizing are basic timeless principles, and you can find a lot of them reflected in some of the earlier work, like uh, Dale Carnegie's work. So when I had the opportunity to have an interview with Stephen M. R. Covey, the son of Stephen Covey, I jumped at the chance. Even more so because the topic that we're talking about in today's interview is his book, Trust and Inspire, How Truly Great Leaders Unleash Greatness in Others. And the reason this really resonated with me, because as I was reading the book, I saw again and again how Covey referenced timeless leadership principles. And I thought, boy, <laughs> there really couldn't be a closer alignment with what we're trying to do here at Timeless Leadership. And I want you to tune into this interview really closely because we start out talking with Stephen about his first leadership experience when he was only seven years old. It was fascinating to me and how his father knew then how to inspire a young Stephen. And this is important because right now, with all the quiet quitting that we're hearing about, and all of the great resignation, and all of the travails that the workforce has gone through, particularly over the last three years, I think it's important now more than ever to understand the difference between traditional command and control leadership, which is what Stephen talks about, and moving toward this trust and inspire model of leadership learning how to create a stewardship with your people, how to actually get them to trust you by simply trusting them. And more importantly, talking about the inspiration part, how we actually uplift people and create this sense of not wanting to disappoint you as their leader. It's different than motivation. So join me now as we get into this discussion of Trust and Inspire with Stephen Covey. Have you ever admired a leader and wondered just what it is that makes her who she is? How he came to embrace the things that advanced him? Welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we look at the principles that define success. This is a show for leaders at all stages of their careers who aspire to understand what it truly means to be a leader. And who is a leader? Dolly Parton said, If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Together, we'll explore key principles, not only in the sense of fundamentals, but also in the ethical sense, the habits, character traits, and virtues that form the backbone of leadership, principles that are just as relevant and essential in the 21st century as they were in the first century. This is Timeless Leadership. Well, hello there. And welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we explore principles and virtues that accompany successful and admirable leaders. I'm your host, Scott Monty. Just a reminder, you can find this podcast and the newsletter that accompanies it, Timeless and Timely, at TimelessTimely.com. It's a Substack publication, so if you want to search for my name, Scott Monty, or Timeless and Timely, uh, while you are on Substack, just check it out right there. Stephen Covey shares the same name as his famous father and also shares the same great leadership principles. Although I should note that he puts an MR in there for his middle initials. He is the co-founder and CEO of CoveyLink and of Franklin Covey 
global trust practice. And he's the author of the New York Times internationally best-selling book, The Speed of Trust. Stephen is a sought-after and compelling keynote speaker, author, and advisor on trust, leadership, ethics, culture, and collaboration. He speaks to audiences around the world. Got his MBA at Harvard, and he's the former CEO of the Covey Leadership Center, which, under his stewardship, became the biggest leadership development company in the world. Stephen lives with his wife and children in the shadows of the Rocky Mountains. Stephen Covey, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Hey, it is so fabulous to be here with you. I'm really excited for today. Well, thank you. And I am equally as excited. We were talking a little bit before the show here. Uh, This is kind of like an industry legend uh, come to the show. So uh, between you and Tom Peters, I feel like I've got bookends here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you, Scott. I'm, I'm delighted to be on this show because the whole idea of timeless leadership and really timeless principles is is what I've been about, my father was about, and and uh, so I really resonate with the whole premise of. Yeah, well, thank you, um, and let's talk about that a little bit because you um, you have a wonderful story in the beginning of the book about how your father first trusted you with a job around the house when you were what was it seven? Yeah, seven years old. Tell me about that. Yeah, he was trying to teach us kids responsibility and initiative and. And, um, and so he, he, he asked me if I would be willing to take care of our lawn, our yard. And, you know, that sounds pretty easy today, but back then, this was before we had automatic sprinklers. And we had three different parts of our lawn that had three different sprinkler systems, and you had to manually turn it on and, 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 and uh, take care of it that way. And so he trained me over a couple of weeks' period of time to make sure that the, 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 the lawn was green and that it was clean, green and clean, you know, results, words. <laughs> and he said, now, all I care about, son, is that the lawn is green and clean. How you do it is up to you. So he didn't delegate methods, he delegated results. And he empowered me and told me to take responsibility. And he trained me on how to do it, how to turn on the sprinklers and so forth. And then he also added one more piece to it. He said, you're going to judge yourself. I'm not your judge. You're your own judge. And what you're going to judge yourself is against green and clean, these results. And the only thing we'll do is is once a week, let's walk the yard together, and you can tell me how it's going. You can tell me how you're doing. But you judge yourself against the green and clean. So he kind of set this agreement up. And again, I'm a seven-year-old boy, and this was a big, big thing. So he turns the job over to me, Scott, and, and um, it was in the middle of the summer. So it was on a Saturday. All right, after two weeks of training, take it, you know, take it on. Turns it over to me, and then I did nothing. <laughs> I did nothing <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Never, tur- never turned the sprinklers on. It's the middle of the summer. It's scorching hot. The, the lawn is turning yellow by the day. You know, we'd had a neighborhood gathering over the weekend and there was you know garbage strewn all throughout the yard it was not clean and it was not green and uh um and my dad said he kind of felt that maybe he should just take the job back and and uh, I was too young um or he also kind of felt like maybe he should just start micromanaging me <laughs> and telling me what to do and you know forget this idea of delegating results and and just tell me what to do but he stayed with it cuz he kind of remembered that his primary purpose really was to raise his kids and more than raise grass and so so uh he stayed with it but he did come back to our agreement and said let's let's walk the yard you tell me how you're doing and when we did, when we walked the yard together, you know, I looked around and I could see this is not green and it's not clean. It's yellow and messy. <laughs> and, and I began to break down and cry. And I said, you know, this is just so hard. And my dad kind of nicely said, well, what's hard, son? You haven't done one thing yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what was hard was me to learn to take responsibility, to take initiative, to own this. And, and, um, 
and so I asked my dad, I said, would you be willing to help me? He said, what was our agreement? And I said, well, you told me you'd help me if you had time. And he said, that's right. Do you have time, dad? I've got time. So I ran into the house and I, and I it came out with two garbage sacks. I took one of them and I gave one garbage sack to my dad and I said, I started to direct him and said, would you go over to that you know, mess over there and pick all that stuff up? Because it makes me kind of sick. <laughs> and he said, hey, I'm your helper. I'll do whatever, whatever you want. And it really was at that moment that I realized this is my job. It's not my dad's. It's my job. He trusts me to take on this responsibility. And look, I'm directing him. He's my helper. And I'm judging myself. And at that moment, I took ownership for the job. And from that day forward, throughout the rest of the summer and for many years thereafter, I took over that responsibility. And the yard was green and it was clean. And, and you know, my dad would use this all the time in, in, in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and his, his other teaching to talk about how this was a great example of, of a win-win performance agreement or of stewardship delegation. And it was those things, but I was seven years old. I didn't know what those words meant. <laughs> but here's what I did know as a seven-year-old. is what I felt. Yeah. I felt trusted. I felt my father trusted me. I felt like he believed in me. I felt like he had confidence in me. And he helped me gain that confidence in myself. And I, I felt inspired by this. And I kind of rose to the occasion. I developed capabilities. I took responsibility, took initiative and gained an enormous amount of confidence. And it really was an early imprint in my life of, of a trust and inspire parent who really was providing trust and inspire leadership to me where he believed in me and helped me come to believe in myself. And I rose to the occasion. And so I used that kind of right at the very outset to just show it's in these little things. And and, and it's throughout our lives that when we have a trust and inspire leader that believes in us, has confidence in us, gives us a, a chance, an opportunity, we tend to respond to that. And it brings out the very best in us. And then we want to live up to it. And, and I had such a leader, and I'll bet many of our listeners maybe have had such a leader, a person in their life, whether a family member, a friend, a mentor, a coach, someone that believed in them, had confidence in them, just like my dad did with me, and what that does to all of us when that happens. And so I use that as, as kind of an opener because if, that, if it can work with a 7-year-old, it can probably work with a, a 27-year-old <laughs> exactly. or a 47-year-old or a 67-year-old because the principles there – you know, to your point, they're timeless. Yeah. It's, you know, responsibility, accountability, expectations, and, and people tend to rise up or down to that trust that is given or not. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, a simple yet powerful story that really captures so much of that. And the fact that, you know, your dad as a parent was willing to trust you as a seven-year-old when so many parent figures will simply take charge and tell their kids what to do. And the reason is because I'm the parent and I said so. And that's a, that, I mean, of course you have to resort to that in some instances, but that overall style of parenting can be very limiting for a child. That kind of leadership can be, be very limiting for a team. And I know at one point in the book, you talk about assuming positive intent. And when we've, we give people the benefit of the doubt and we say, okay, well, they want to succeed. They want to do well here, but their style is getting in the way. Can you talk about what you mean there in terms of style and how it uh, potentially uh, inhibits that intention? Yeah. See, I, I think that most people and most leaders have an intent you know, to do good, have an intent to be a good leader to be a good manager, a good boss, whatever their role might be. Um, very few really say, hey, look, I want to make life hard <laughs> on everybody around me and on, <laughs> and on my direct reports and, and on my kids or, or whatever. Now, most people have good intent to, to be a positive contributor. It's just that they also you know, might have their own approach of how they would do it or they might have a hard time letting go or truly empowering um, or what have you. And so I think most people's intent is good. And yet so often 
our style, how we go about doing it, how we go about leading gets in the way of that intent. We might care deeply about our people, but they don't know it or feel it, even though we, we feel that we care about them. And it's interesting, I, we did a survey one time of, um, of a company where we, there was 500 of these top leaders. This was a big company. It had over 100,000 employees. And, and we asked the top 500 leaders, do you genuinely care about the people that you serve in your organization? Mm. And this, the, the survey came back, and 99% of these leaders rated themselves at the very highest possible level of caring. We had a seven point scale, 99% put themselves at a seven out of seven, you know, one to seven, at the highest level of caring. And then we asked the people in the organization, does this senior team care about you? 31%. There was a 68 point gap. Now, now who's right? Well, they both, they both could be right, right? I mean, the, the senior team could care but the people may not know it, feel it, believe it. Yeah. But if you've got a 68 point in, gap in caring, you know, what's it going to look like when you try to uh, tr change the compensation program and people don't think you care about them or change the career development process and they don't think you care? You're going you're gonna to face resistance at every gate without that. And in that case, look, style was getting in the way of their intent. Their intent was that we care, but people didn't know it or feel it. It often happens to most of us as leaders is that oftentimes our style gets in the way of our intent. Our actions get in the way of our beliefs. And I like to frame it that way because I'm assuming positive intent that most people's style is good and to want to make a difference and to be a good leader. But how we go about doing it, our management style, if you will, can sometimes get in the way of that intent that we have. And, and so this book is saying, become aware of your style and you are not your style. You can choose to rescript, to change, you know, you know, the idea of what got us here won't take us there. So change your style to be relevant for, for um, this new world of work and, and to be aligned with what your intent really is. That's the idea behind that premise. Yeah. And, and part of recognizing our style, I guess, is recognizing that we're coming from many, many years, decades uh, of, uh, of what you call a command and control style of leadership. And we're trying to move from command and control to trust and inspire. And that requires a different mindset. It requires uh, different behaviors. And it requires communicating in a, in a different way. Can you talk about a little bit between what the difference between a traditional command and control environment feels like and how you know, maybe through the stewardship principles that uh, you're suggesting that we get to a more trusted and inspired kind of leadership? Yeah, I think that, let me say this in our defense for most of us, I think we've improved in our command and control. <laughs> and, and we've, you know, it might have been initially decades ago, a more authoritarian command and control. I think most of us have become more sophisticated about it, more advanced. We brought in things like emotional intelligence and mission and strengths and other elements that make this far better than what it was. But in many ways, it's, it's, it's just an enlightened command and control. We still haven't really shifted the paradigm of how we view people and how we view leadership. You know, the idea that there's greatness inside of everyone, not just the high potentials. Our very definition of having high potentials tells, me, tells us that maybe we see some as having potential and others not, but there's greatness in everyone. And my job as a leader is to unleash that potential, not to contain or control them. And I see people as whole people, body, heart, mind, spirit. So my job as a leader is to inspire, not merely motivate. And I start with an abundance mentality, not a scarcity mentality. So I elevate caring above competing and so forth. These are the kind of fundamental beliefs about how we view people, how we view leadership. I think you start with that because until you change the paradigm, you won't really um, see a permanent shift in the behavior. It will tend to be uh, back and forth. 
But once that paradigm begins to shift, then you focus on what I call, and you mentioned this, the, the idea of these stewardships. And a stewardship is a job with a trust. And one of the fundamental beliefs is that leadership itself is stewardship. It's about our responsibilities, not just our rights. Mm. It's about our influence, not just our position. So if I believe that leadership is stewardship, a job with a trust over, you know, with the people with whom I am leading, who are in my care, um, that then what are those jobs with a trust for me as a steward, as a leader? And I think it's very simple. And I frame it just as three simple things, but very difficult things. You, we need to model, we need to trust others, and we need to inspire. Modeling, trusting, and inspiring. Modeling is who we are. It's our credibility. It's our character, our competence. And we model the behavior that we seek. We model the values that we espouse. And we go first as a model. The leader goes first. Trusting is all about how we lead. It's, it's what my dad did with me with green and clean. He trusted me. He empowered me. He, now, he wasn't a blind trust. It was a smart trust. He had expectations that the job would be green and clean and accountability built in that we'd walk the yard once a week. And I'd tell him how we're doing against green and clean. And so, but, but he trusted me as a seven-year-old, trusting our people, giving them the opportunities to, 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 to do their work, even to make mistakes, to learn to get better. That is a stewardship we have because that helps develop them. It also helps them rise to the occasion, perform better. And they actually will do more. They'll do better when they're trusted and they tend to reciprocate and give it back to you. And then finally, inspiring others. That we have a stewardship as a leader to inspire those who we lead. And you might think, well, you know, I'm not charismatic. <laughs> I can't inspire. And, and I think too often we've equated inspiration with charisma. And I separate the two because they're not the same. I know some people who are charismatic, but who are not inspiring. And I know others who no one would describe necessarily as charismatic, but who are extraordinarily inspiring because of who they are, because of how they care so deeply and the connections that they make and and how they tie to purpose and meaning and contribution, truly inspiring, and not necessarily charismatic. And so inspiring others is a learnable skill. Everyone can inspire. And we inspire when we connect with people through caring and through belonging. And we inspire when we connect to purpose and to meaning and to contribution. The point is everyone can inspire. It's a learnable skill. And it is a stewardship that we have as a leader for the people we lead, to model, to trust, and to inspire. It's a simple idea. It's just very difficult in the, you know, to actually do it because it tends yeah. to, it's hard to you know, be that model all the time to go first. It's hard to extend trust when we're worried, will the job get done well or, or if we have a hard time letting go or if we've been burned before. And it's hard to inspire when we really never thought of that as something that's learnable and doable, and if we're not charismatic per se, that, you know, that idea is a kind of a paradigm shift, but, but, but the, the concept behind it is, it's just straightforward and simple. It's, it's, it's a stewardship. Yeah. So I'm curious when leaders find themselves in a moment of urgency, when, you know, the board says, Hey, we need to see results, for example. And I know so many chief marketing officers in particular who have such a short tenure at companies. I think it's down to about 18 months now because the, the expectations are so high for results-driven performance, they don't get a chance to actually put strategies into place and see these strategies play out longer term. So I guess I'm curious on how we work on trust and inspiration when urgency is dangling over our heads like the the sword of Damocles. Yes, yes. Here's how I would respond to that. I'm, I want to kind of reframe what Trust and Inspire is and what it isn't. What it is, is it's a way of seeing, communicating, developing, and unleashing 
the greatness that's inside of people so that we can, in fact, get better results. What it's not is just soft, weak, slow, you know, um, just kind of a belief in people without expectations or accountability. You know, that lack of expectations, low accountability, that doesn't inspire anyone. So the opposite of command and control is not trust and inspire. The opposite of command and control would be abdicate and abandon. You know, there's no leadership there. You're abdicating. You're abandoning. There's no vision. There's no expectations. There's no accountability. That's more the opposite. So if if command and control is excessively hands-on, trust and inspire is, or excuse me, abdicate and abandon is excessively hands-off, whereas trust and inspire is hand-in-hand. Hand. So this is strong, but it's strong without being forceful. Trust and inspire it's not weak. Um, it, you have high expectations. You have high accountability. And, and you can move fast with this. You build a relationship of trust. Nothing is as fast as the speed of trust. Your ability to deliver, perform. You build a high trust team, high trust culture. You get greater creativity, greater collaboration, greater innovation, greater engagement of people. You'll get better results and outcomes. And, and so you can be authoritative without being authoritarian. Interesting. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's kind of saying trust and inspire is actually a very, you operate from a position of strength. And so you, you challenge, it's just that you do it in a way that involves the team and say, look, team, we are under tremendous pressure to deliver and to perform. And we're going to do this together as a team. I put you in these roles because you're the best. I believe in you. But we've got to do these things. We've got to achieve these results. And, and, um, and so that's job one. You know, how we go about doing it, I think, matters too. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to empower you. We've got to collaborate. We've got to innovate. We've got to come to each other where we have shortcomings and, 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 and uh, gaps so we can help each other achieve this. And so you can still take on tough things. You can still operate um, efficiently in a, with a trust and inspire mindset. You know, if I'm a parent and a child runs into the road, I'm not going to sit and say, well, I hope that I've trained them well and they, that they know to turn around. No, I'm just going to grab the kid. But I, I'm still a trust and inspire parent yeah. if I built that relationship. And that's the reality. And so in a sense, I could be, as a marketing leader, I could be saying, look, we got to perform. we got to perform now. So I'm going to try to map out a vision of what I'm seeing we need to do. I'm involving you in this because I need you to help me execute on this. We're working with each other. Just not, it's not doing it to another person. You're not operating out of fear. You're not operating out of transactional exchange of fairness. It's just, it's more around inspiration and yeah. collaboration and, and involving people in it and coming up with the solutions together, including the fact we're under the gun and we got to move fast and we need yeah. to perform. Yeah, I think, and in that, one of the most powerful things a leader can say to his or her team is, I need your help, right? Just like your dad said to you when you were seven. He didn't tell you how you had to do it. He, he, he gave you the goal, the overall vision for what he wanted, green and clean. He said, I need your help to make this a reality, right? So in that sense, you're turning to a team and you're saying, hey, I trust you to give me the actionable insights or to come up with the solution so we can solve this together. and. I think that's so much more powerful than uh, saying, well, I've got the answer. I'm the smartest person in the room. Uh, you know, I've, I've actually got a client like that right now who is phenomenal in his industry. And he's kind of wavering between a CEO and a chairman role right now. And at times he comes in like a sniper with solutions where he's all over people, micromanaging them. And at other times he swoops back and you don't hear from him for weeks at a time. And it's this whipsaw effect that you don't know what you're getting. And he's very helpful when he's there, but when you need an answer from him, he's not there. So it, it, we're, we're stuck in uh, some of these situations now where you want to tap into his intelligence, but you want him to dial it back so the team can naturally step up and serve in the roles they've been selected for. Yeah, beautiful. I agree with that. And sometimes... We see this back and forth 
this pendulum swinging. Maybe someone's been told you're a micromanager. And so they kind of lay off, but then they're, then the pressure comes on and, <laughs> and you know, they got to deliver the results now, the quarter of the earnings, and they kind of maybe swing back into the, you know, the micromanagement role type of thing. And they go back and forth, but it just, it's, it's confusing to people. Right. And it feels like you're doing it to me and, or at best for me, but not with me. Right. And this is about, you know, that's what Trust Inspire is. It's what I can do with you, not what I can do to you or even for you. That's transactional. It's transformational, what I can do with you. And so you build that agreement. In a sense, you do the equivalent of what my dad did with me up front. You build the agreement of what green and clean is and looks like and how do we know how we're doing? How do we walk the yard? And, and if you do that well up front with people, you can be far more empowering of them because you have built in control through the agreement. It doesn't have to be you micromanaging, hovering over people and kind of, you know, how you doing and, 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 you know, I, I see you're not doing very well. No, it's, you're allowing them to judge themselves, govern themselves, evaluate themselves against the agreement you built together that has clear expectations, high expectations and accountability. But it just looks and feels different when you do that up front versus when you don't and then you go back and forth and then suddenly the boss comes in and feels like a micromanager and, and, um, and, and you know, puts you into a frenzy or then backs off and what have you. You just don't know where you're coming from. So again, I, I just put all this under the idea of leadership style and that we've just been so conditioned over really decades in society around more of a command and control model that's become a better version of it in enlightened command and control. But the paradigm still around people is that I'm still viewing people as things, as a means to an end, not as an end in and of themselves. And so I, I manage people and things. And that's what you do as command and control. But trust inspires is, that, is I manage things and I lead people. So I'm trying to get results in a way that grows people. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, leadership, obviously, partially about results, but ultimately it's about growing people. And as you say in the book, and I'm a firm believer in this, when we go to work, we are whole people. We don't leave our problems at the door. They're still with us. We're carrying things around. And whether it's, you know, a sick child at home or an elderly parent we need to be caring for, or a doctor's appointment we need to set up for one of them, or, uh, you know, the, the 82 Zoom calls I have this afternoon. I mean, all of this weighs on our, on our psyche, and it's impossible to separate out who we are from what we do. So I think acknowledging the whole person in this, is that's helpful in building that relationship, isn't it? It's invaluable, absolutely. And because now you're real, you're authentic, you're recognizing that, look, you bring your whole self to work. It's, it, we're not just economic beings that are working for a paycheck. And that's part of what we do. We want to be paid. We have a body. And that matters to us, and we need to survive, and we want to be paid fairly. But we also have a heart, so we want to connect and want to um, feel a sense of caring and, and, and belonging. We have a mind, so we want to develop. We want to use our strengths. We want to um, make a difference and contribute. We have a, a spirit, so to speak, a, you know, a holistic desire for purpose, for meaning, for contribution to matter. And so this is the whole person, body, heart, mind, spirit type of thing versus just, you know, we're there for a paycheck. And, and so we bring this whole self to work. And so that's why I say that people don't want to just be motivated through carrot and stick motivation. That's part of it, but people want to be inspired. Mm. Motivation is external, extrinsic. You know, it's the carrot and stick. Does it work? Sure. It motivates people to want to get more rewards. But inspiration is intrinsic it's internal it's inside of people it's like the lighting the fire within and that can burn on for for um, weeks of, or months or even years when that fire is lit within versus in the carrot and stick you got to constantly provide more carrots more sticks just constantly feed the hungry bear whereas inspiration can burn on and we breathe life into and, and, you know, so when you see people as whole people, you're breathing life into that relationship, that team, that culture, and igniting the fire within. 
And that's just such a better way to lead and it honors people. Mm. Because you see them for who they really are as a whole person, not just as a fungible economic being that I can replace with another. Yeah. And, you know, just such a different way. And people respond differently because of it. Yeah. You know, in, in some ways, it's uh, so interesting. This ties back to one of the first episodes we did on this show. It was with uh, Marilyn Gist, who wrote a book on leadership humility. And you're never going to believe this. Uh, Alan Mulally contributed a chapter to that book. And the idea of leadership humility is honoring the dignity in every person. And it's just, as you say, honoring people, acknowledging them, inspiring them, making that connection rather than just kind of bulldozing over them in an effort to get a task done. Yes, it, it's, see, see, that's a mindset. It's a paradigm, as well as then it gets translated into actions, into behaviors. And, and, um, but if, if you really don't have a mindset that views people as whole people, if instead of your mindset is really that they're just uh, you know, fungible, meaning replaceable economic beings. If, if it's not this person, I can just bring another person in. You're just viewing them as a means to an end and not as an end in and of themselves, oh. as a whole person who has dignity. And we honor that and, and we dignify that. That People sense that. They feel that. It makes a profound difference. And, and again... Let's make sure we match our style with our intent. Because we might feel like, I, I do care about people and I want to honor people, but our style may scream that we're not, that we're viewing them as things, not as people. We're managing them as things. Even the word management, I'm, you know, I'm not against management. In fact, I'm in favor of management. We need good management. We need great management of things, of systems, of processes, of financials, of the numbers, of the business. And we need great leadership of people. Mm. Again, manage things, lead people. Simple but difficult. And when we, we become really good at managing, then we start to also manage people in the same way. We manage people like things. And, and if we do that in today's world, in this time of the great resignation and, and so forth, if we manage people like things, we're going to end up with no people and a lot of things. Because <laughs> they, they won't want to be a part of it. Yeah. They'll want to go to a place where they feel trusted. See, people don't want to be managed. People want to be led. People want to be trusted. They want to be inspired. I think they always have. That's the timeless part of this. But the timely part of this is that now the expectations of people is shifting and changing. They want to feel this now before they might have accepted feeling like they were in a command and control system. But less and less is that true today. And, you know, in terms of the timeliness yeah. of these timeless principles, is the expectations are shifting and changing. And these, the younger generations, the millennials, the Gen Z, have a completely different expectation of how they want to be engaged, how they want to be uh, led and trusted and inspired, not just managed. Mm. Well, I'd like to end on one of the final chapters of your book. And I think it's so critical because here at Timeless Leadership, we are firm believers in leadership coming from anywhere. And as we say in our introduction, quoting Dolly Parton of all people, uh, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. And your chapter uh, 15 is trust and inspire in any context, parenting, teaching, coaching, and more. And I was struck by a little worksheet that you have in here on page 276, where you have uh, just a handful of questions that you go through. And it's framed in a family context, but to me this is, again, the, the beauty of this paradigm is you can apply this to any leadership position in which you find yourself, whether you're a parent, a coach, uh, a, a business leader, etc., you want to take us through some of those steps, some of those questions that you ask people to reflect on as kind of a, a toolkit for moving themselves forward and learning how to uh, create trust and inspire others? Absolutely. So, I, you know, the, the whole premise is that the key to becoming a trust and inspire leader is to first become 
a trust and inspire person. So again, we see ourselves as whole people and not just kind of we have our leadership life and then our personal life. No, we apply this at every dimension. We're whole people. And so we try to be a trust inspired person as a means of becoming a trust inspired leader. And so I, I start off with, with um, you know, just saying, let's just take a family situation, a family context. And, and so we examine kind of how we view um, the people in our family. And that could be children, uh, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, parents, however we might look at family members. And I'm just using family as an example to start. So some of the questions might be these, you know, to a, who in my family would benefit the most from being more trusted and inspired by me? What I found is if you can identify one relationship and just work on one relationship, that will give you a sense of how real this is, becoming a trust and inspire, and what that might do to another. And if you can do it with one, you can do it with another. And it's a way of kind of seeing the power and the value of being a trust inspire person, a trust inspire parent, a trust inspire leader. Start with one relationship. So I'm inviting people to say, identify someone in your family who you think would benefit the most from being more trusted and inspired by me. Then I kind of give the, the reader and, and the, the leader, the parent in this case, or the, not necessarily the parent, the family leader, let's call them, a, a series of questions. As I think about that person, that I want to, that relationship, I want to become more of a trust inspired leader in that person's life or influence in that person's life. How am I seeing that person now that may be limiting me? How do I view them? How do I see them? Do I see their potential? Do they see their? Do I see them as having greatness inside of them? And and um, and because if I don't see it, then how how will I ever communicate to it, or how will I ever unleash it if I don't see it? I love the statement by Henry David Thoreau: "It's not what you look at that matters; it's what you see." So do I see? How do I see that person? And then I might look at that and then I might say okay I see them right now as maybe limited or having some potential but not a lot then I might reframe and and say this is how I now choose to see this person and I look at their unique strengths and their unique gifts and talents and maybe I choose to see them more holistically more completely or see greatness that maybe I didn't see before so back to Thoreau Maybe I change what I see within that person and have it be more complete, more whole. Then once you see that person that way, you go from seeing to communicating. How will I, so the question is, how will I communicate the greatness I see within this person? So see the greatness, then communicate the greatness. Then I move to developing. How can I develop and cultivate this person's greatness so see, communicate, develop, and then I move to unleashing. How can I unleash this person and free him or her to become even greater? And then I might ask overall, and what might be the impact of that if I could do this? See the potential, communicate the potential, develop the potential, unleash the potential, treat people according to their potential, not just their behavior. So imagine if each of us could do this in one relationship in our lives that matters to us personally, a family one. It could be a one at work as well, these same principles of assessing where you're at, how you currently see them, what's a maybe more complete way of seeing them, how could you communicate that, how could you develop that, how could you unleash that, what might be the impact. It's just an invitation to all of us and and I, I get this from the flip side of it of has there been a person in our lives who saw potential in us yeah. in each of us as listeners saw potential saw greatness and believed in us and maybe believed in us even more than we believed in ourselves at the time took a chance in us 
trusted us, gave us an opportunity, and maybe they did such a good job with us that we came to believe in ourselves and see that potential in ourselves. I'll bet most of us have had someone like that, and I'm just inviting each of us to become that person for someone else. And again, if you can do it with one, you can do it with another. And it's just a taste of the power of becoming a trust and inspire leader. Yeah. I mean, it's so powerful. And, it, you know, it reminds me of a leader I had at one time when I was just starting out in business who saw something in me, maybe that I didn't see in myself. And he said, Scott, you need to remind yourself, I have arrived. And I thought, well, okay. I mean, I can, I can do that, but it's when somebody like him tells me that he realizes that I have arrived, that really kind of boosts that to the next level. So it, it goes from self-confidence to understanding we have the confidence of others. Yes, absolutely. And that's what the best leaders do, right? Is, you know, the good leaders help you build confidence in that leader. The best leaders help build confidence in you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you get that sense of self-confidence. I think it was Eleanor and Roosevelt that said that. That's the best leaders. And, and um, what a difference that makes. And so find the ways to see the greatness and to communicate the great greatness so others can come to see it in themselves. And then we'll begin to really develop and unleash people, the potential, the talent. And you can do this individually. You can do it one-on-one. -on -one. You can do it as a leader of, a, of an organization. I use it as an example of that, what Satya Nadella has done and continues to do with Microsoft. Over these last uh, seven plus years that he's now been in as CEO, where he's come in and, and when he took over, um, many thought that Microsoft had seen its best days, that they were in the past and they weren't the cool place to work anymore as much as they had been and they weren't as as relevant in their innovation and in their collaboration. There was a lot of infighting and the like. But Nadella comes in. He's a trust and inspire leader. He modeled, he trusted, and he inspired. And, and he, he started with a growth mindset, not just for himself, but for everyone to see the potential. And he asked all his leaders to have a growth mindset for their people. And if someone would say, well, I've got problems with these people because they don't have a growth mindset, he'd put that on the leader. It's your job to help them ad to adopt and really believe in a growth mindset for themselves. You help them see that. And, and by doing this, he really, by modeling, trusting, and inspiring, they call it model coach care, they unleashed the potential, the greatness, the talent inside a workforce. And today they're extremely relevant they're winning in the workplace. They're winning in the marketplace. Um, they're one of only two companies valued at over $2 trillion. And, and so they've had the economic success, but also the internal success. They're not perfect. I know that. But they're unleashing an entire workforce through leadership style. And, you know, being a trust and inspired leader can unleash that in people, in teams, in entire organizations. And we need that in our world, in our society. And and, you know, that's at the grandiose scale. And, and I, you know, you and I have been talking about how each of us can do this at the personal scale in just one relationship. The point is, this is a better way to lead in our world of work today. And, and a new world of working requires a new way of leading. I call it trust and inspire. But to your timeless idea, in a sense, it's not really new. It's always been the best way to lead. <laughs> it's just becoming more recognized and more relevant with what's happening in our society that we recognize we've got to shift. Command and control doesn't work anymore as if it ever really fully did. <laughs> <laughs> but trust and inspire is a better way to lead in our, in our world today. It certainly is. And uh, Stephen Covey, author of Trust and Inspire, how to truly, uh, excuse me, how truly great leaders unleash greatness in others. Thank you so much for joining us here on Timeless Leadership. You are welcome, Scott. Thanks for hosting me. I love talking with you and love what you're doing with this show. It's wonderful. Moving from command and control to trust and inspire isn't as simple as flipping a switch. But when you take the time to change things up and show your people how much you care, there's no telling all the good you can create. Thank you for joining us and for being an advocate for timeless and principled leadership.
whenever and wherever you find it. I'm Scott Monty. Until next time, may you dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. For you are a leader. <laughs>